الله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله فإن أصدق الكلام كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته You guys sound tired, man. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, you know, it's a great honor, a great privilege to be in your presence this evening. Um, I want to thank uh, Brother Jamil Kareem for organizing this program and giving me an opportunity to address, you know, this very important topic and this very honorable uh, audience. I say all of that to say be nice to me all of that to say be nice to me um, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows some benefit to come through this session and that at the very least you hear something or learn something that will spark your interest in our tradition in our deen uh, and learning it um, whoever thought about the program title, Human Rights in Harmony with Allah's Rights, I just want to commend them for being extremely brilliant, man. And also being, much, uh, somebody just shook hands like, yo, that was my idea. That was me, bro. Right? So much for modesty. Some people just on, like, on the low just duck their head like, Jazakallah khair. He was like, that's, that's me, baby. That was my work. Um, because one of the things about being a minority community that is often disparaged uh, in the media um, is that you spend so much time defending your integrity, telling people you're not a terrorist, telling people you, know, you only want to be a peaceful, law-abiding citizen, telling people you're only against oppression, that you never actually offer them glimpses of the profundity, the significance, the power, the depth of your own religious tradition. You spend, I, I guess a, a better way of saying that, a more simple way of saying that, you spend so much time telling people what you aren't. And this is what I think it means to be a modern Muslim that you scarcely ever tell people what you are. This is what I actually believe in. You're so busy telling people what you aren't. Um, the other thing that I think is uh, powerful about this program title is that Muslims should always be concerned with things that impact human beings, right? Our sphere of concern should never be limited to just Muslims, or just African Americans, or just Palestinians, or just Indians. Anything that impacts human beings should be of concern to us. Why? Because we are the followers of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Allah said about him, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have only sent you as a mercy to everything that exists. So if it's something of significance to people, it's something of significance to us. And human rights goes right to the core of what everybody is talking about right now. I mean, even when I saw the title, I thought, I mean, they really want to talk about LGBTQ stuff. I mean, that's what, I mean, you know, you talk about human rights. I mean, let's be honest. What, I mean, I mean what, what, what is this really about? I mean, what did you really walk me into? I know. But the fact that we are also formulating opinions about these issues, that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? So the first thing I want to say in terms of my... Um, I'm getting into the body of my, of my speech. The idea that human beings have intrinsic value is something that is established by the book of Allah. 
Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Truly we have ennobled all of the children of Adam. This means that all human beings, all men, all women have a God-given value that they cannot forfeit. They are valuable. They are worthy of being treated with respect. They have a, a kind of inviolability, a kind of sanctity that the Muslim recognizes. Even if we say that what they believe is wrong, even if we say that what they do is wrong, there is still a way they must be treated as human beings. You know, the Prophet ﷺ, and these are hadith that some people don't like to study anymore, but I think these hadith are very important. He would say, even to Mujahideen going into battle, avoid striking the face of anybody if possible, because the face bears the traces of your father Adam, salam. Right? We have in Surah Al-Qiyamah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about those who give food ala hubbi, even though they love food, to the orphan, the traveler, right, Ibn al-Sabil, and even the asir. The word asir in Arabic is prisoner of war. That means even somebody that just maybe a, an hour ago was fighting you, trying to kill you, this was a man who was trying to kill me. He's still worthy of being fed. He's still worthy of being clothed. He's still worthy of being treated with respect. Why? Because he's a human being. He is one of the children of Adam. The uh, ayah that Amin recited at the beginning of the, the dars, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnaakum Oh, humanity. Right? One of my teachers, he said, somebody should grow, go through the Quran, collect all of the ayat that begin with Ya Ayyuhan Nas, O humanity. Because you will find that the khitab or the message of those ayat is a little bit different than the message of the ayat that begin, Ya yuhalladina amanu, O you who believe. Because when Allah says, Ya yuhalladina amanu, what that means is that, O you who believe, if you don't have iman, if you don't have faith, what comes next might not make sense to you. It might not be intelligible to you. It might not be anything that you can act upon if you don't have iman. But when Allah says, Ya ayyuhannas, this means, no matter who you are, no matter what you believe in or don't believe in, what comes after this is relevant to you, speaks to you, applies to you. So God says, oh humanity, addressing all men and all women, we created you from one male and one female. This common parentage that we have, we created you from one male and one female. That means, all of us are actually brothers and sisters. And God made you into nations and tribes. Right? So yes, there is some difference. There is some variance. You know, you know, some people speak Arabic and some people speak English and some people speak Gaelic and some people speak Italian. And there's, that's intentional difference. But we all have this common root, this common bond. And we have to, like, remember that when we see people, man. We have to remember that even when we see people behaving in ways that might make us question, like, what is the value of their humanity? They're still human, man. Right? And we should make sure that everybody knows this is what we believe in. Especially to get on topic, man. Is this being recorded? Watch what I say, you know. Especially when we're talking about people, you know, using their God-given right to choose how they want to live to make bad choices. We have to remind them that I see you as a flawed human being. I see you as a deeply mistaken human being. 
I might even get honest and say, I see you as a sinful human being. But I still see you as a human being. I don't dehumanize anybody. You know, one person came to me and he said, how am I supposed to teach my children that people doing all of this stuff, you know, same-sex marriage, and that they're just people, but they've made mistakes? I said, how do you teach your people, how do you teach your children that people who say Allah has a son are just people? We teach them that what? These are people. What they believe is wrong. Allah does not have any partners, and Allah does not have any children. But they're people. They're wrong. Inasmuch as they are people, we intend to be good neighbors to them, be good colleagues to them, be good co-workers to them, be good classmates to them. But if they ask us for a principal position, what does your religion say about this? You tell them the truth, that it's wrong, that it's morally incorrect. But in as much as I have no authority over you, in the position that I am now, this will be a matter, if you choose to stay where you are, this will be a matter that God judges between us. This will be a matter that God judges. My job is just to treat you in a manner that is consistent with your humanity. That's my job. I'm not, you know, if you ask me, I'll tell you. But I do not put people into categories, nor do I... Uh, determine my treatment of people based on what they do in their bedrooms. Not, that's, not, that's, that's not even our world view as Muslims. That's not even how we see people, right? Okay, we see somebody and we think, you know, how they like to be intimate. That's not even how we see people. Now, yes, intimacy, sex, I know we got some younger members of our audience, but you guys are mature, inshallah, it's still subject to the shara. You can't do it in a way that you, any way you want to, right? But in spite of how somebody might engage that practice, they're still a human being, man, and you have to respect them. You have to treat them with that respect. It's intrinsic to them. Now, when we talk about the hukuk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the rights of Allah, just as we believe human beings have rights that they cannot forfeit, that they cannot uh, uh, um, um, give away, we also believe that God has rights. And one of the rights of Allah is to be obeyed. That's God's right. When we obey Allah, we're not doing so out of like, you know, wishful thinking or, you know, it would be nice or, you know, funny, man. One of my friends said he gave a non-Muslim uh, a translation of the Quran and asked him to read it. And he said that the feedback he got from the non-Muslim colleague was, I mean, I enjoyed it, but the God of the Quran is kind of bossy. <laughs> you know what I'm the God of the Quran is like a little bit bossy. And he said, well, if you were omnipotent, if you were all powerful, would you plead with people? Would you negotiate? Well, look, you know, I'm, I'm God Almighty. I was wondering if, you know, maybe you wanted to, if you were interested. So it's up to you. It's up to you, but... If you want to maybe offer me a few prayers, if that interests you. No, that's not the way that this works. You know, I remember once talking about the hukuk of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was sitting with one of my teachers, and I thought that I was being really intellectual, really clever, right? And I said, you know, when I meet people that aren't Muslim, and I invite them to pick up a copy of the Quran, I always tell them, I tell them to start with the Juz Amna. I tell them to start with the 78th right, chapter of the Quran and, and not to start with Baqarah. He said, you know, he gave me one of those looks that your elders give you like, what the hell are you talking about? He said, why did you tell them that? I said, because, you know, 
Makra has so many rules and so many injunctions, and it's a Medini surah. It was revealed in Medina, so it has a lot of like, do this, don't do that. I just think that you know somebody considering Islam or someone that isn't Muslim yet, I just think that's kind of heavy on them. I just feel like Juz Amma is dealing with you know the core concepts. You know, uh, Akhira is dealing with creation, telling us to reflect the fact that we've been created. You guys are like, you're, conv you're convinced by my argument. Like, yeah, that is a good argument. He looked at me and he said, no. The order of the Qur'an is the order of the Qur'an for a reason. I said, what's the reason? He said, when you read Baqarah, you're left with the conclusion that whoever revealed this Qur'an, whoever revealed this book, whoever is speaking in this book, is speaking from a place of absolute authority. Right? He's not pleading with the listeners. And then he said, Allah is telling you in words of one syllable, this is my program. You can get with it, or I got something hot for you. <laughs> this is my program. This is what you're going to do. If you don't, there are consequences and repercussions. That's right, because God is speaking. And he said, why would you remove that clarity from somebody's experience with the Qur'an? No, that clarity is what they need. No, this is, this is it. Here, yeah, look, we're not, we're not kidding. So these are a part of the rights of God, right? God has rights that supersede the rights of human beings, right? Look at the, look at the name, uh, and a lot of the people of Aqidah, you know, there's a lot written about the name of Allah, El Mutakabbir, right? El Mutakabbir, which if you were to refer to a person as Mutakabbir, this would be an insult to them. If you said, who is Mutakabbir? He's arrogant. He's conceited. He's haughty. But when you say about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, El Mutakabbir, it's not arrogance. It's not haughtiness. It's not conceit. It is only denoting his rightful position. This is, he is rightfully mutakabbir, right? So Allah has rights that supersede our rights. The goal of the human being, inasmuch as we have been given choice, is to recognize that what God has given us is good for us, man. You know, one of my teachers, he told me this, and I will never forget this for as long as I live. He said, God has given human beings free will. Right? You get to choose. And we're not going to go into a lengthy discussion about Kesp. And we, I, can, I actually am familiar with the arguments of the Hanbalis, the Ash'adis, the Mu'atazila about Kesp, but you don't want to hear about that stuff. You want to hear about something that you can hold on to. So for all intents and practical purposes, you have the right to choose what you do, what you believe in, right? Your goal is to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That what you have given me, what you have commanded of me, what you expect of me is good for me and I accept it as such. It's good for me. Everything, there is nothing that is good that Allah Ta'ala has prevented you from. Nothing. Nothing. And there is nothing that is harmful. Nothing that is um, um, dangerous that Allah has not prevented you from. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has not warned you about. So yes, you have the right to choose, but why would you choose against what your generous Lord is offering you? Why would you choose against that? Now, you can choose. You can choose to do whatever you want, but Allah is telling you, this is the path that will lead you where you want to go. Right? All human beings have consciousness. Even evolutionary biologists 
have a very difficult time explaining the origin of human consciousness. That human beings are uniquely conscious animals. We can actually imagine ourselves in time space. We can imagine where did I come from and then find the teth habun. Where am I going? See, human beings can actually conceptualize their mortality. Hmm, there was something before me. There's going to be something after me. I'm alive. One day I will be dead. Like, we can actually think about that. Other creatures don't demonstrate that ability. They say, in as much as we have the ability to think of ourselves in time space, to conceptualize of our mortality, the thing that we want most is salvation. All human beings, salvation. That's what you really want, right? You want salvation. That when this thing ends, I'm going to be okay. You know, I was, I was joking with Jamil that since I've turned 40, I know it's hard to believe. I know it's hard to believe. I know it's hard to believe. They look like it ain't that hard to believe. No. Since I turned 40, I find myself thinking about it more and more. Meeting with Allah. And the thing I want more than anything else is salvation. When that moment comes, what will become of me? That's what you want more than anything else. And God is telling you, do this and you'll be fine. Follow my Rasul, alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You're gonna, I'm, I'm going to take care of you. This is all I'm asking of you. But, you do have the freedom to choose. If you don't want to, there will be consequences for that. Right? And so this, to me, is kind of the, the very delicate interplay between our rights as human beings. Right? We have the right to choose. You know, um, people are worthy of respect in spite of the choices or, you know, they, they may make. But what God demands of us, it supersedes, it takes precedent over what, you know, any formulation of human rights might uh, offer. Right? So um, I want to make sure, you know, we leave time for a lot of conversation um, because I came here realizing this issue for a lot of people is really about uh, LGBTQ um, you know, discourse, rights. Um, I told my family, I'm going to make my preliminary remarks intentionally very short, 15 minutes. 20 minutes. How long have I been talking? 15, 20 minutes. I've been talking to y'all now? No, no, I, I, I intentionally wanted to make my remark. So the conversation can be, you know, free flowing, and um, you know, uh, the difficult part about giving a lecture is that you speak, and you don't know if you're addressing the concerns of the attendees. Answering questions is much easier in that regard. They ask you, "This is what I want to know." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's not, you don't have to guess. Is this relevant? Is this not relevant? So I just wanted to lay that foundation. You got to respect people. Human rights are real. They're established by the Quran. But the rights of God supersede those of, 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 of human beings. And from there, uh, let's talk. So we're going to try and spend the next 10 minutes. 10? No, we need at least 15, 20. They call the Adhan for Isha. Inshallah, we will we will spend as much time as needed. Bismillah. Uh, let's, let's go. Uh, asking questions. If anyone has a question, uh, I guess we should you know raise our hand, and inshallah we will uh, get to uh, answering that question. Uh, don't don't worry about it. Or if you would prefer, we have some of the sisters here. One of the sisters can go around, take your question, and then she can bring it up uh, for us. And we have one of the brothers here. If you would rather somebody bring your question up for you, they can bring it up also. So, uh, is there anyone that has a question or would like to ask a question? Another question there, Bismillah. Waalaikum salam.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. You know, we're commanded to live between khawf and raja, between fear and hope. And one statement that I think embodies that ideal um, almost perfectly is a statement attributed to Amr ibn al-Khattab in which he said that my fear of God is so great that if it were announced on Yom al-Qiyamah that everybody is going to heaven and there's only one person going to hell, I would fear that that one person was me. And he said that my, my hope in God's mercy is so great that if it were announced on Yom Al-Qiyamah that everybody was going to hell and there's only one person going to heaven, I would hope that that one person was me. The goal is trying to hold those two in a dynamic tension that produces a meaningful relationship with Allah. Right? And Lillahi Mathal Al-A'la, of course, for God is the highest you know, example. But one of the things that I think about in that regard is the people that I want to please the most, the people that I'm trying hardest not to displease are all of the people I know would forgive me if I did. That's just how it is. Like, man, there is nothing I could do. You know, mashallah, my mother recently embraced Islam. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. Happiest day of my life. You know, I had been a Muslim for 22 or 23 years before my mother embraced Islam. And when I think about teaching my mother Islam, and I need to be more diligent doing that, you know what would be the hardest lesson for my mother? Something that I'm like, I, I just don't know if she could accept that. Is loving and hating, or loving and disliking for the sake of Allah. Because she prides herself on loving her children unconditionally. Like my mother is one of those, there's nothing you could do. Nothing that would make me stop loving you. Nothing. Right? I don't want to, even though I know my mother feels like that, I don't want to displease her. I don't want to let her down. I don't want to test the limit of her love for me. I don't want to misplace her trust or break her confidence. I don't want to do those things, even though I know, man, there's nothing I could do. I always think that we should relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a, um, a similar fashion. There's nothing I could do for which he wouldn't forgive me. I know that. Right. Um, Allah sees me exactly like I actually am. Forgives me and loves me in spite of that, inshallah. But I want to be the best I can in his sight. And so it's, 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 it's almost like a person must be possessed of some nobility of character. Right? There's different kinds of people, man. You know, there's some people that, and this is actually characteristic of a psychopath. If people are nice to them, they only see this as an opportunity to take advantage of them. See, that, that's actually the chief characteristic of a sociopathic or psychopathic uh, tendency. The nicer you are to me, the more I abuse you. See, that's a sociopath. Whereas a decent person, the nicer you are to me, the more regard I have for you. Right? The better you treat me, the better I want to treat you. Right? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, walillahi mathal al-a'la, is reminding you that his mercy overcomes his wrath, he's reminding you that, you know, aside from shirk, he forgives all sins. The Prophet alayhi salam is reminding you that anybody that has an adharra, in Arabic, that's the smallest thing you can have is a dharra, right? Anyone that has a dharra of iman, Allah will eventually, even if they're cleansed, Allah will eventually put them in Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ is not telling us this so we can say, okay, I can do whatever I want to do. He's telling this 
to us so that we're inspired by our Lord's mercy to be better servants of our Lord. Right, man, my Lord wants good for me. My Lord wants me to inherit his paradise. Why would I disobey a generous Lord? He wants good for me, right? And it shouldn't be something that we understand on the basis of technicality. You know, I remember once <laughs> I was studying hadith with a brother. I can't, I can't knock this brother because he really was just a practical person. But we were studying the hadith that when you do a sayyah, when you do something bad, it's recorded for you once. But when you do something good, it's adaf, it's multiplied. You know, from ashura ila mia, from 10 to 100 times. He looked at me and he said, bro, that means if I do something bad, like say I, I smoke a little weed, but then I give some sadaqah. I'm at least like nine points up. I'm like, I'm like nine points to the good. And I said, Kaulun Hakun Yuradu Bihil Batil. See? This is an expression in Arabic. Kaulun Hakun Yuradu Bihil Batil. It's a true statement. He is nine hasanat up. If he does something bad, he does something good. But the Prophet didn't tell us that to justify our sins. He told us that to make us hopeful of God's mercy. Right? He didn't tell you that so you could say, bro, it's, it's all good, man. Go ahead, just do whatever. Do a little southern car afterward, man, you nine up, man. That's not calling Hakun you to be Hilbaltil. That's not that's not the point. So knowing of God's mercy is not supposed to inspire us to sin. It's supposed to inspire us to love, not just obedience. See, I think one of the things that we miss, and this is why we find it very difficult to achieve any of the sweetness in the ibadah that the Prophet ﷺ achieved, that the companions achieved, that the righteous achieved, is because we forget in kuntum to Allah. Say if you love God, that tabi'uni. Follow me. I think we just think about this, you know, nine up, you know, there's deeds, there's a scale, you get ten points here, one point, one misdeed. No, 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 no. The Prophet is telling you these things about God's mercy so that you can love your Lord. You can love him. You see? And if you love Allah, this will animate and guide the relationship with him. You see? If you would, again, Lillahi Method al-A'la, think about your relationship with anything that you love. Anybody that you, I'm assuming everybody here loves someone. Think about how you think about the relationship with them. Right? Do you, does does a, 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 a husband that loves his wife say, well, hold on, you, you want me to do what? Let me, let me look at my book of fiqh and see what your rights are. Well, technically, it says here it's food, clothing, shelter. So I guess, you know, that uh, Balenciaga bag is out of the question. No. If I have the resources and this is what will make you happy, I'll do it. If I have the resources and this is what makes you happy, I'll do it. It's not about what you, your rights are. I like to do things for you because I love you. You see? This is the relationship they had with Allah. It's not like, what's the bare minimum? What's the halal? What's the... I want to do things for my Lord because I love my Lord. Those hadith are supposed to inspire that love. Right? Don't use them to make us you know, haphazard and negligent in our relationship with Allah. Does that make sense? All right, um, unfortunately, I'm no. sorry, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, time is really uh, ticking against us. Uh, we have a couple of things that we need to do. Um, those things are, alhamdulillah, the brothers just brought the food up. We have uh, tacos for you guys. Um, but but also, also, hold on one second, one second. 
Also, we have a giveaway that we do during this time, and we need to make sure that we give away uh, the things that we're doing. But uh, the, the Imam and the Sheikh is, is definitely uh, feeling uh, the vibes. I'm feeling what he's saying. What he just said almost brought me to tears, honestly. Uh, just something that we, we overlook. So, I one more question. One more question, inshallah. If we can get this. I'm going to spend I'm 30 sorry. minutes answering it. I'm too. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Whatever the question is, <laughs> I'll spend 30 minutes answering it. Let's see, inshallah. One more question. And, uh, okay, we have two. All right. She had her hand up first, and then I'll get to you. Yes, sister. Um, I want to say a couple of things. One thing I want to say is that, you know, I'm here tonight because I love Jamil Kareem. I love this community. And I'm also here in a professional capacity. And, you know, Allah Ta'ala says, Woe to those who don't give the full measure. And I remember I was uh, at a restaurant with a brother. And he was a fast food restaurant. He was putting fries into a box. People would order fries and he put the fries. And he was putting the fries in the box to where they were coming out of the box. I'm like, actually, that's enough fries, man. What are, you, what are you doing? And he said, if somebody here orders a large French fry, they're going to get a large French fry. Because the last thing I want somebody asking me about on Yom Kiyama is some fried potatoes, man. You know, yeah. and, I, you know and, I, and I remember thinking to myself, that's taqwa. That in, his, in something like just giving people food that they paid for, I don't want to be a mutafif. I don't want to, you, you order a large, you think the car, make sure it's full to the top. That's a man of, 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 of taqwa, right? So I was hired here. I want to make sure I fully discharged my responsibility, right? I don't want to be a mutafif. He came, he stayed for a couple minutes, a little speech, and then left. No, no, that's not, that's not what we do. Um, as far as to the, the, the question itself, um, subhanAllah, you know, Imam Ghazali says something about this that I think, mm, when it just it scared me. So maybe it would scare your friend too, right? He said, anybody that's doing haram, and people are telling them, you know, repent, make toba. And they're saying, oh, you know, Allah's merciful, Allah's merciful, Allah's merciful. You know, I'll get around to it, I'll get around to it. Imam Ghazali said in his Ya Yuhal Walad, he said, how does this person know that they're going to be safe from fitna? And he said, Oh, well, fitna is in salbul iman. The first fitna is that their iman could be removed from them. Whenever a person says, I'm going to spend the next 15 years committing some sin or something like that, and then I'll make toba when I'm in my 40s after I make hajj, why do you think you're still going to believe in something you've been disregarding for 40 years? Why do you think you're still going to be, you think you can ignore something for 40 years and then it's going to be important enough to make you change your life? No, it doesn't happen like that. You have taught yourself this is insignificant. This is unimportant. And that will probably be the course that your life takes. So Imam Ghazali said, why do they think they're, they're going to be safe from the Iman being taken? You think, oh, I'm going to make Toba in 20 years. Why do, you, why do you think you'll have Iman in 20 years? It's just, it's, just something to, it's just something to think about. Why do you think you'll have Iman in 20 years? The other thing I'll say about this, and I know I only got two minutes. I can't spell my name in two minutes. Is <clears throat> the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the Bashir and the Nadir. So he was the warner 
And he was the you know, person that inspired hope. And in order for us to be good in our wild, in our da'wah, we have to have a little bit of both of those. We can't just tell people about the things they want to hear all the time. God is merciful. You know. We also have to remind people there's a hell. It's fueled as men and stones. There's a hell. There is judgment. There is a day that will make children turn gray-haired, make women miscarry. There is a day when we will stand at the doorstep of eternity and be judged for our deeds. How you want to show up? People do die. Death happens. You know, Ibn Ta'ilah Sakandari, he said, a person that's doing that it's like somebody that takes poison and then takes the antidote. They take the poison, take the antidote. How do you know that one time you might take the poison, you might not be able to reach the antidote? You die from the poison. You know, that does happen. You know, when, you know I think, you know, text messaging, text messaging, I, I, I find in texting this crazy reminder if you ever look at the phone record of somebody that passed away, it's deep. Because none of them knew that they were going to pass away. They were planning their lives just like we're planning ours. Yeah, man, I see you tomorrow. What time you'll be at LA Fitness? I'm like, oh, he really, I mean, that's life, right? Yeah, t uh, hey, 10 people, I got all 10. Hey, look, I'll bring the Gatorade. And then maybe, you know, this movie just came out. and Just, plan, just planning life. He didn't know he was going to get into an automobile accident that night. He didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't know. He was just like I am right now. Whenever I think about that, it's just like, it just scares you. You know, it's like, man, he, didn't, he, was, he was just saying, you know, he was actually on the phone, even bring it closer, on the phone with his wife, uh, what you want from the restaurant? Okay, I'm, I'm bringing, okay, you, what topping? Okay, I'm bringing it home right now. That was the last text message. Anchovies and pepperoni. Last text message. OK. Then something happened. So my point is like, yo, we got to remind people. We got to remind people. Those things do happen, bro. Right? So let's help. Alhamdulillah. Listen, Salah is about to happen. So we need to uh, get ready for Salah. Inshallah, after Salah, we will pass out the food so as everyone's leaving because and we'll take it with us to go, inshallah. We're sorry for holding so long. I hope you guys enjoyed the dars. Uh, inshallah, like we said, we'll be here next month uh, same, around the same time, inshallah. Thank you very much. Appreciate the shaykh for coming through, alhamdulillah. And assalamu uh, alaikum. And uh, we'll, we'll, on our Instagram, check our Instagram. We'll let you guys know about the winners, inshallah.